You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 75, VC versus ICO Fundraising, The Pros and Cons, with Voltoro CEO, Joshua Shigala. Let's go. Hey, so welcome back, everybody, to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Ash, and today on the show, I've got the one, the only, Josh Shigala. He is the CEO of Voltoro. That's Voltoro.com, and they are a global gold and Bitcoin marketplace. Basically, Josh has made it easy and very frictionless for you to spend Bitcoin to buy allocated gold or to spend your allocated gold to buy Bitcoin. If you've listened to the show for a while, I interviewed him on episode 35, and we discussed how gold and Bitcoin are complements to each other, because for some reason, those gold bugs still aren't behind Bitcoin. Josh, welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs, man. Thanks, Ash. It's a pleasure to be back. It's what a great place. What a great show. It's a really good service. I'm still listening. Uh, So last time we chatted, I think that you were in the process of raising some money for Voltoro. um, And, you know, you couldn't chat too much about it then, but I think the round is finished. But before we get into that, just give us uh, a brief background on who you are and and what Voltoro does and how long you've been around. Well, um, I, uh, you know, I've, I've been fascinated with alternative economies like getting away from fiat and understanding how alternative economies happen i built the first swap site back in the day uh in the early 2000s late late 90s and early 2000s and um but i realized it really needed a token money because if if i've got a jacket that you want but i don't like anything of yours that deal falls through so i really started seeing you know money's not the root of all evil the root of all evil for me personally what i can see is how you create that money where's that money come from is it created through debt or is it created through an asset and so i fell in love with gold and and silver and understanding asset based money and then of course in uh, 2010 when i read the satoshi white paper i fell down this epic rabbit hole that i'm still falling down and uh, and loving every day of it because it's just such a trip. It's it's really like living inside of a inside of a sci-fi novel um, because it's just it's just amazing. It's an amazing culture and, and community. But um, basically, I, I got uh, a lot of money stolen uh, or lost a lot of money during the Mount Cox collapse. And uh, so me and my brother sat down and thought right how are we going to make an exchange like a decentralized exchange because this can't happen this is you know it's so many pl- places kept on running off with people's money and it mm. kind of still happens now uh even though it's it's getting better but um it really we we nailed it down to look the, the, the op return codes in bitcoin are good enough at the moment for a decentralized exchange we want real-time trade and all this stuff um, so we focused on a centralized exchange where the counter asset was allocated physical bullion of gold instead of fiat because i got into bitcoin to get away from fiat and here we were trading in and out of euros and and dollars to uh, you know try and find the tops and the bottoms uh, of these markets but when an exchange goes down and you're holding fiat uh, many people don't know that when you hold fiat in a bank it's not your money anymore it's the bank's money you're lending it some money that's why they give you interest and uh, if they if they bet with it wrong they go broke so Allocated gold means that even if something happens to our company, it doesn't matter. Our, our liquidators couldn't touch our clients' assets. Mm-hmm. It's, it's physical stored in, in the vault. But we, um, we focused, because of centralization, we focused on the blockchain to give us total transparency. So we've used the blockchain in a way that you can prove full reserves of gold. That, that, um, and because it's allocated, that's a very important part of the gold story. Yeah, so you uh, took it a to step have... further to help people not only preserve their wealth in Bitcoin, but also you don't have to go back to the fiat currencies, which we know are very counterparty heavy. You know, how are you going to get your money sent back out, out of it? You know, is the bank accounts going to be shut down? What you did is you allow people to go in and out of Bitcoin for another free market money, one of my favorite. Yeah. You, you know, it hasn't rallied and hasn't appreciated like Bitcoin has in the past couple of years. But it's still free market money. It's allocated gold. And I, you guys store that where? It's in Zurich, Switzerland. So it's one of the largest vaulting facilities in Europe. 
um, and it's fully insured. So bank accounts are only insured to 100,000, but because gold's a physical good, and it's you know in a ridiculously high security vaulting facility, a top tier vaulting facility. In fact, the only one that's rated larger uh, or just the same safety level is the ECB, the uh, the European mm -hmm. Central Bank. So its vaulting facility is ridiculously safe, uh, run by Praora, and um, yeah, and and so uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the reason that I brought you back on, Josh, is because you recently closed a funding round, a VC funding yep. round, and we're currently in a sea of ICOs, right? It seems like anybody that can even put crypto or blockchain or a .io ending on their domain seems to want to ICO and raise a whole bunch of money, and it's starting mm -hmm. to get cracked down on around the world, and it's being seen as scammy and all this stuff, and there's a lot of good projects out there but you chose a more traditional route of venture capitalist funding. You know, can you walk us through like where, how, what you thought about whenever you were trying to determine, okay, we want to scale our business. We want to take Voltoro to the next step, but we're mm. going to choose VC funding as opposed to ICO. What was that like and why did you choose VC funding? Well, the thing is, I mean, first, I just want to start this out by saying that I love the concept of an ICO. For me, it's true free market economics. It's true giving the little guy a chance to invest in some of these amazing startups that are happening around, the world, not just VCs that are well connected. So it's, it's a really fantastic, but at the same time, there's a lot of scams out there where maybe, um, I don't know, one of the scams might be where you pull in 20 grand and then you take that 20 grand and reinvest it in yourself over and over again until you've reached 10 million and then the crowd says, well, they've raised 10 million and they, then other people jump in and they sort of manipulate the numbers. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's countless scams, right? But at the same time, there's really amazing companies as well. So you shouldn't just write off because someone's doing an ICO that is a scam. But we thought, look, as an exchange, we, we, we don't want to give a utility token because I find, actually, this is a problem with regulations is that regulations aren't allowing for, for um, a uh, really an easy way to make equity ICOs mm. or a dividend ICO. It's all utility tokens and ICOs. They're the ones that are truly legal. Uh, and so people have, have got a great concept, a great business model, and then they have to try and weave in there some sort of token to mm. try and raise that money because they need a utility token. And then it just screws up with the whole idea. So we're seeing sort of ideas getting mushed that don't really need a token. But we saw this and went, look, we really, the only ICO that makes sense for us is an equity ICO um, or a dividend ICO. But we just felt that the, you know, we, we really didn't see that the regulatory framework was right enough. And, you know, we all saw that the reason why Satoshi brought out a, a Bitcoin, you know, invented Bitcoin was because it's illegal to mint your own money. And effectively, if you're creating uh, you know, digital tokens and saying that's this and that. It, it, you're creating instruments, and then the states, I have Soren, just yeah, starts, you know, don't compete down. with them on, on making money. Exactly, exactly. So, but we, we, we also thought that the VCs that we found, you know, we'd been looking for two and a half years to find a, a, a really good VC that both loved our idea and we, lo uh, we loved them and their, their ethos and their way of working. And finally, we found someone. So, uh, and we signed and, and uh, did a lot of due diligence and worked through that. But, but they bring not only money to the table, but also a network of uh, portfolio companies because they're in the FinCEN space. Uh, on the, in, sorry, in the um, fintech space, and um, and so it allows us to, you know, reach the biz dev sort of side of things where we can develop with their portfolio companies, but also have help with law and all these other things. Um, but, you know, an ICO, I think we don't want to rule it out. Maybe we'll do one later on uh, because I really would like the normal Joe to be able to invest in someone like us uh, and, and take part in the journey that we're taking on. Of course, there's risk, you know, there's risks in any company, but um, I, I, I would like people to have the opportunity to also, because with great risk comes great re reward, right? That's why VCs do this. Um, yeah. In, with all these regulations, I mean, the government really does shut out the majority of investors. I mean, unless you're an accredited investor, and I think that means your net worth is over $1 million U.S. million mm. in the United Liquid. States. 
liquid US dollars, right? So you're not able to invest in some of these maybe really good ideas and really good companies that you could really increase your net worth over time because you have the knowledge, you just don't have the working capital, the liquid capital. So I'm a huge fan of ICOs as well. I know that in my, one of my previous podcasts with uh, Edmund John Lowell, we spoke at the end about, you know, you got to do your diligence and, and look at uh, these ICOs and be skeptical. But as a way to self-fund and as a way for the little guys to jump in here, I think, you know, I'm a huge supporter of ICOs. Uh, it makes sense that governments aren't because we're boxing out their buddies and the old ruling class. So, of course, they're not going to like ICOs. But, Josh, you guys went for VC funding, and I heard you say you felt like it was better to expand your network with VC funding. Is that because now the investors in Voltoro have an actual stake in the company, whereas with the ICO, you just kind of get liquidity and no real equity? That's right. Um, it's, it's, it's actually interesting because I, I hear a lot of VCs now starting to really look at ICOs with a lot of a bigger eye because they're like, actually, you know what? I, I don't really care that much about control. I, I, I care more about liquidity. Hmm. And so being able to, to, to an ICO is a lot more liquid, right? You, you've got these tokens and you can liquefy them. You can get rid of them, sell them on the market. You know, you probably move it if you're a big player in that, but um, it, it lets you liquefy, whereas they don't have any control of the company no stake in control. So it's a, it's a really interesting battle. And I think a lot of CEOs, uh, sorry, a lot of VCs are going through this um, discovery period of what, what, do I, what do I like better? What do our investors like better? What are the family offers that, is, that are giving us this money to, uh, to make more of? Uh, yes. think about this. So let's chat a little bit more specifically about the pros and cons of VC funding over an ICO. And then we mm. can maybe flip that and talk about the ICO benefits. But what did you and your team see as VC funding? Again, you spoke about um, uh, the network, you know, bringing in people that own a part of the company and they're committed to more pot committed to the company so you can go to them. But like, do you get board members or, you know, I, I've, I've never raised any money using, mm. uh, you know, any VC money. So I think I just asked this yep. out of my own curiosity. Yeah. I mean, look, there, there is so much wrong with the VC model. It really needs disrupting because, uh, it, it, you know, VCs are sick and tired of looking at a billion different pitch decks you know they, they it's but it's just super hard to get in touch you need to find someone that knows them that you need an intro then you need so you need to go you know playing golf with someone that knows someone and then weasel your way to find you know it's just horrible it's it's a horrible way of actually raising money it takes a long time you have to be well connected and um and you know you can't be building the actual product during that time and so it's a very, very tough thing unless you've, um, you know, got mates in, in, in tall buildings. Uh, it's very, very hard to, if you're just a young entrepreneur, to go out there and do this. And that's why uh, ICOs are a really good option. Saying that, the ICOs have problems because you now have so many ICOs, you just get lost. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you can't just write a white paper anymore and expect to gain $150 million mm -hmm. like Bancor or some of these. You know, you really, you need to already have VC funding behind you to market your ICO to the crowd to get people and get the hype machine going and build FOMO and all this stuff. Yeah, what I'm noticing is the people that are having the, some of the best rounds, OMG comes to mind are the people that already have a cash flowing business and a provable business model and they're incorporating blockchain tech and a token to expand their business model to, to grow it and evolve it rather than being a blockchain company. They're already a more traditional company that is seeing how blockchain and tokens can fit into their business. You know, I agree with you. The days of writing a white paper and trying to raise 25, 50, a hundred million dollars are probably coming to a close. Not mm. because of government crackdown, not because of government yeah. regulation, but because of free market regulation, because of the mm. preference of the investor, the preference of you and I or any of these listeners that are looking for a good return. And what's yeah. going to give you the confidence of a good return? Is it going to be, you know, 
five hackers that wrote a white paper that have never built a business before and they have two advisors that are semi reputable or a company that's already worth you know 50 million dollars and decides to add their add uh, a blockchain tech tech and a token to their business to try to expand you know are, are you seeing the same thing or i mean am i off base here no exactly it's it's definitely um it's definitely changing a lot and i think this is this is a true case of people need to lose money in a new market to understand what the new market's all about. And, and that, that sucks. It's a horrible, horrible reality. But you, you, even government needs people to lose money first to even understand how people lose money and to try to regulate it in a way that they won't lose it again. So, you know, this is a brand new marketplace. Uh, it's a brand new idea, the ICOs and all these things. And so what I feel is that we've made all the rookie mistakes now. People are like, look, you, all you've got is a white paper and a bunch of photos and advisors. And a nice um, website. And a nice website. And so, you know, yeah, I'm interested, but I want to see a little bit more. I want to see a little bit more. I want to see a little bit more. And, and this is where VCs come in, where they, they, you know, this is what they do professionally is they go and do due diligence on every single person, have a, you know, and, and, ICOs do, do there are really great ways of doing due diligence on some of these ICOs, especially if they're a protocol based ICO mm. where they're actually building a protocol. But if they're a company and they're using open, building open source software, uh, even some closed source software where part of it is open source, you can see on the GitHub, oh, look, they get commitments every day to this, this open source project. Right. Um, there's X amount of people working on it. The, the community in the Slack is quite huge. You can start building a picture of how real this thing is. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what is the difference between a scammer and an, and an entrepreneur? You know, they, they both just have ideas. They've both just got white papers. One person has the intention of actually building the thing. And creating value and creating value and the scammer does not, you know, it just wants to do it. So, so I think as we move forward, it's very, very, very important. And this is one of the reasons I didn't decide, uh, I, I decided against an ICO at this stage is because I feel that market needs to self-regulate first, uh, mm. properly. We need, you know, as a, as a, as a community, uh, we need to start building best practices. Um, some rated uh, private uh, market rating agencies might pop up to rate ICOs properly, uh, where professionals go through and do all the due diligence and give their rating. And then you'll have competing rating agencies to give different ideas. All these things will pop up if we don't demand that government comes and, and slams us. And I see, uh, you know, I, I respect tone base a lot uh, and, um, and these sort of people, but you know, they, they're really just slamming all ICOs saying that they're all scams yeah. and it's just not true. You know, it's not true. There's a lot of really good entrepreneurs who see this as an opportunity of raising money. But if we, if we start demanding regulation on something that the state or even we as a community don't really understand yet, we don't know where this is going. I think there's plenty of ways to self-regulate to have best practices, to have lists of best practices. Hey, have you followed this best practices list? You know, I mean, basic things. We don't need a gun in the room to try to uh, deal with this. We can first go to the easiest things of saying, hey, look, you know, first of all, regulation doesn't work on a global market. You'll have certain countries that are regulated one way, certain the other way. People will arbitrage around it. Dumb money will always find bad investments. Yeah, uh, It's just how it is. If, if ICOs were so locked down that only the rich uh, accredited investors could invest, hey, you know what? Grandma, who was about to invest in the ICO, is going to go spend at the pokies instead, at, right. at the slot machines. Yeah. So, you know, there's nothing stopping, you know, this whole notion that, no, you know, government's there to stop old people losing their money or, or whatever, or, or dumb people losing their money or people, not, I shouldn't say dumb, people that are not educated to make money with money people just chase, um, chasing trends or chasing a, a return yeah they're, they're going yeah. to lose their money they're going to go bet it on the dogs or the horses or they're going to go to vegas or i, yep. I don't know you know and, and it's weird you know i i think tone vase is a very interesting guy you know i think chris derose is a very interesting guy i don't really agree with either one of them on very much because they're both either calling everything a scam or Chris DeRose is going and begging the U.S. government to come and, 
you know, slam all of these ICOs and it just mm. doesn't give us free people a chance to self-regulate. You know, I mean, DeRose is probably the worst guy on the block about this. Why are you going to go beg your, your master to come mm. and regulate us who are trying to self fund and build a freer, more secure future, right? Mm. Like, give us a chance to build up our own free market based regulatory systems and, and organizations and institutions so we can compete. Whenever you go kowtowing, cow, hold on, Dex. <laughs> Whenever you go begging the government to come in and save the day, you're basically asking for a monopoly. You're asking yep. for one centralized corporation, if you will, called the government, to come in and, and regulate and say, this is good, this is bad, this is a scam, this is not. Why don't, if you're, if you're a real liberty entrepreneur and if you're a real fan of freedom, why don't you want a hundred agencies coming in yes. and, and saying, well, 97 think that this is a scam and these three over here think it's a really great investment. Like what's mm. going on with these three over here? What are their, what are their interests, right? What are their incentives? And okay, well, these 97, that, I mean, that's a clear majority here. I'm, I'm going to trust them rather than having the SEC come in and say, oh yeah, Bernie Madoff, now he's a good guy, invest with this guy, right? I, mm. I just, I, I just don't understand. I don't, and, and it makes me think that, you know, Maybe, maybe they're like a wolf in sheep's clothing. I, I'm not sure. I don't want to get too far into you know, talking about anyone personally, but I, I'm really skeptical of anyone in the crypto space going to the government and asking them to come and like basically shut down or become the monop monopoly regulator on our ICOs, our yeah. self-funding mechanisms. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is that you know, Bitcoin comes from an ethos of figuring out technical solutions to very complex social problems and finding the game theoretical mechanisms to do that. So incentivizing bad actors not to be bad, um, incentivizing good actors not to become bad actors. So uh, that's that, and that for me is the same with ICOs. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about digital assets, whether that's a coin or a, or a token. And so by, by building mechanisms in the, uh, that we can build technically uh, is is way better than coming in with a jackboot of the state and saying you aren't allowed to do this and you aren't allowed to do that. And I understand people demanding that because they hear a story or a talking point of grandmas investing into ICOs and they don't even know because they're investing in someone who invests for them, right. and and they just get sold to and say yeah you're gonna you know two hundred percent in three months and stuff, but again we we need we need to put our heads down and figure out free market mechanisms and and this will happen anyway i mean we're already seeing it happen people aren't putting anything uh, just a hell of a lot of money into random stuff now that just has a big uh, catchphrase in it they really want to see more and more um details um yeah of course there's the odd one that where, where there's just fomo but at the end of the day, there's so much noise now. It's really, uh, it's starting to happen. The self-regulation is starting to happen. And we see small businesses uh, like Smith & Crown, for instance, popping up and starting to rate some of these ICOs and start starting to rate some of these coins. I mean, a mm -hmm. shout out again to Bruce Fenton for releasing Spacesuit X. Uh, you know, this isn't an actual spacesuit or your ticket to the moon. This is, is an acronym for all the different ways that he uses and recommends that you go through to analyze an ICO or to analyze a, co a coin, right? And again, we'll link to that in the show notes, but we're already seeing this building. So, you know, just give us another 12 months, you know, let, let, let us just show you what the free market can do because the last thing we want to happen is, you know, the government come in with their monop monopoly regulatory privilege and, and make, the cryptocurrency space as efficient as maybe the healthcare space or the DMV or our court systems because, or, or our legacy banking system, right? There's, there's, there's basically one regulator of the legacy banking system. And I'm sure you've had issues in the past, Josh, finding banking solutions in the crypto space because I've turned away hundreds and hundreds of cryptocurrency type companies and no, you can't have banking solutions. So, Anyways, I, I think I think everyone gets our point here, but 
the good news is that we are building these types of uh, competitive market-based regulators, or I don't even like the, to, to use the term regulators because that's, that's their term, right? That's mm. their term. We, mm. can't, we can't use their language, right? Mm. They're, they're, of course, being the government. We're, we're more like, um, I'm not sure what it is, but we don't regulate. We, we like try to inform and educate people about the pros and the cons of, of these different types of corporations and these different ICOs and stuff. But the regulation comes from your own personal preference. If you're feeling FOMO and you get into an ICO and it drops the tank and you lose 90%, well, guess what? You're probably going to remember what that feels like and not jump on that you know, and not react to that FOMO emotion last time. I've done it in the gold space. I've still got gold stocks that are down 75%. Thank you, Peter Schiff. Thank you, James Turk. Thank you, Jim Rickards. You know, thank all the guys that gave me this FOMO sales pitch where if I wasn't investing in these small cap freaking gold stocks and I was going to miss out, mm. I've learned my lesson mm. and I don't do that anymore in the crypto space. Mm. Let's circle mm. back around here, Josh. Um, where do you think that you lost out on or that you're at a slight disadvantage by doing VC funding as opposed to ICO funding? I mean, we're an established company. We're already turning a profit. And so I think we would be good candidates for an ICO. I think we could have raised uh, a lot more money than we did with VC and without giving away any equity. Uh, or maybe we would have done an equity round. I, I'm not sure. But uh, one thing I can say is I think we would have had a good chance uh, at raising a lot more money so that we did miss out on that. But, you know, I think when I look at some startups they, they, that are doing ICOs, they're raising, you know, 50x, uh, 50 million or something like that. And you, no startup <laughs> needs that much money. Like, guys, if you throw 100 million at a startup, they're not going to do better than when, you had, when they had 20 million. Right. I, I can just absolutely prove that. Uh, by, by, because there's only so many resources. You have to stay focused on one thing. You know, I see like people at uh, groups like Bancor that raised 150 mil and now saying, oh, we're, we're, we're putting 50, uh, 50 mil of that uh, into a VC fund. I mean, that's not even their business. Yeah, I know. It's not even their business and they're going to do that with it. I mean, you know, whatever, but it's, it's like you, you, they just don't need to raise that much money. Um, second of all, I mean, I think... I think we, um, I really like when the, the network effect that gets produced by having an ICO is wonderful. Mm. I think, uh, you know, having a community that's invested in you and invested in, in the project um, uh, going well is, is fantastic because they then, you know, have, a, have an incentive to go and, 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 and uh, talk about you and, and, and promote media and, right. the service. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully they get a kickback from that too. And so, um, you know, there's definitely that, which I, I, I love that side of it. And, I, and again, I think it's also, you know, I think our, our members missed out on the fact that they couldn't invest because I had a lot of emails from a lot of our members saying, hey, I really love what you guys do. I want to invest. And, and so I, I really want to give them the opportunity to do that down the track. So we'll probably look at an ICO as well. Yeah, the community Down aspect the is huge for these ICOs. Yeah. You know, I mean, yep. I've, I've joined countless Telegram groups and Facebook groups and Slack channels and people get really energized. It's such a great way to energize people and you just yeah. don't get that, I don't imagine, again, I can't speak from experience, mm -hmm. but I imagine you don't really get that type of community energy whenever you're raising VC funds because you're not appealing to your customers or to your would-be customers. And even though, the people that are buying ICOs, they don't own a stake in the company, but they feel like they own a stake in the company, right? And yep. so you get yep. really excited about it and you're going to talk about it and, oh, you know, OMG does this better or, you know, mm. whatever, Bancor does that better or BNT does this better. And yeah, these are, yeah, I mean, one way that I judge ICOs is log into their social media and, you know, how many how many people are part of their social media? How much engagement do they have? You know, are they mm. act, are they active on Twitter? Are they you know answering questions from their community? Are they coming out like Augur does a really great job every single Friday? They release a, a weekly update and really yeah, yeah I I think that's great and you know yeah. I I do own some Augur but I uh, you know it's just it, it seems like it's a lot more open source if you will 
in in the mm. ICO world because you, mm. yeah, they have to run marketing a lot. A, you know, you you didn't have to run any marketing campaigns to raise VC money. No, right? No, yeah. But but in the ICO world, you know, then that's you know you're teetering on. Okay, are they just trying to sell me, or is this you know legit marketing because they're making a difference? But uh, again, I, I know I'm talking in circles here, but I, I'm I'm a big fan of the ICOs and of private mm. private like regulation. And I just found it fascinating, yeah. Josh, that you guys could have raised, I'm sure, multiples of I don't know how much you raised, but I'm sure you could have raised multiples of what you did if you ICO. But yeah. what what type yeah. of legal issues do you get into when you do an ICO versus a venture capital race? Because the laws are already pretty pretty cut and dry with VC funding. They're so well structured. Um, you know, we, you definitely you have different types. You have, you know, convertible notes or equity stakes, or you know, there, there's and and very standard contracts. Uh, thanks to the work in Silicon Valley that they've put in over the years, and that spread around the world now, and being used as a as a framework. Um, whereas ICOs, the legal the legals are still very very grey. Um, even if one country might say it's legal, you know. Legalities are all about the 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 tiny nuances in language, <laughs> and and uh, because you called it a coin instead of a token, right? Uh, that means you know you you are totally on the wrong side of the law, <laughs> or whatever. Um, and and these are things that are playing out, and um, we we you know they're, they're clearing up now. More and more are getting clear, and there's places like um, Gibraltar. The state of Gibraltar has, has put a lot, uh, the country has, has put a lot of work into building a good uh, ICO and crypto uh, regulatory framework. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of government regulation, but banks are, and for companies, if you're running a company to want to interface to banks, banks want to see you, that you're sitting in a good regulatory framework so they know the rules of the game and can interface with that. So... As we move forward, we're going to see a lot more clear regulations around ICO specifically, uh, which will, I think, be a big sigh of relief for a lot of companies that want to go down that path. Yeah. And so do you think in the next five or 10 years or maybe 20 that VC funding is finished? No, I, I think VCs, um, you know, I, I think... I think anyone that wants to do something serious as an ICO will need to get money in beforehand to get the word out. Because if you, uh, you can stand in a crowd of, imagine you're standing in a crowd of 3,000 people all trying to raise money, yelling ah, at the top of their voice. How are you going to get your voice heard? Mm -hmm. Of course, you need some money in there so you can buy a ladder and a megaphone mm -hmm. and scream it louder than the others. And so I think where VCs are going to step in, they're going to be at pre-sales. And uh, I think they're probably going to be even more important, funnily enough, which is disappointing because I like the thought of getting rid of VCs altogether <laughs> and just going straight to the crowd. But, you know, who knows? Maybe there'll be some disruptive thing that will allow people to do pre-sales right. uh, without single, single big players. But the big players also give a good stamp of, Hey, we've done our due diligence because VCs mm. really, I mean, it's, right. uh, you know, VCs have a war on trees every single time they do an investment because there's so much paperwork. Right. It's, it, it's insane. So, you know, they really with a fine tooth comb, go through every number, everything. And, um, and they go through the team because that's who they usually invest in mm. is the team instead of the product. So, so I think VCs will definitely have their thing, but I, I think what will happen is that the investor will become a lot more, clued in they'll start to think like a vc because they have the chances to invest like a, like a vc and do you think that's because we're going to have more and more resources to make it easier for smaller investors to think like a vc or to look and invest like a vc definitely definitely i mean you know nine out of ten small businesses fail so more and more people will have to think very very critically and, and very specifically at how to invest because nine out of 10 fail, you know, you've got 90% chance of failure. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an investor, so, um, you know, once, once people have been burnt one way, they'll start not doing it, not looking at any company that has those things that they got burnt, how they got burnt, not in there. 
they'll tell their friends, oh, don't watch, watch out for that. You know, just like when Mount Gox collapsed, now people are demanding more transparency in exchanges. And, and people like myself are going around giving talks and educating people what to look out for. How, how does transparency work? What does it look like? And uh, th these are all things that are, that are happening. So let's quickly talk about what's on the tip of so many Bitcoiners' tongues right now is when is the big money coming in? When is the hedge fund money? When are the big guys coming in? Do you see that anytime soon? Or do you think the government is going to make it so scary or such a regulatory nightmare compliance-wise and risk-wise that it's going to be a long time before big money comes into this crypto space? Jamie Diamond isn't stupid. You know, you can call him stupid for calling Bitcoin a fraud, but the only way Di Jamie Dimon is stupid is if he wasn't shorting it before he called it a fraud. And so these players are already in here. Goldman Sachs is saying it's great. Jamie Dimon's calling it fraud, but they're talking about it and they're doing stuff with it. I can guarantee you, I think we're already in it. I think hedge funds are secretly stacking. Uh, they're working with uh, over-the-counter players like BitPay, BitPay hasn't sold any Bitcoin uh, for, cat, for, for fiat in a long time. Uh, they, they keep selling this these crypto onto people that want to, um, uh, want to buy the crypto, uh, not, not liquidating it to a, to a general market. They, they're selling it over the counter. Um, and, and, and I think that's the same with, uh, with a lot of players. And, and when things like China bans Bitcoin. I mean, they've banned it over and over and over again. I cannot believe that they aren't accumulating in some sort of fashion. Um, you know, yeah. So I, I think I think the big money's here. They're just very good at keeping it low because keep it on the down low. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, just, yeah. just like Russia comes out today and says, "Hey, you know, we're not so sure about cryptocurrencies, but we've got this crypto ruble over here that you might be interested yeah. in." You know, it's it's not mineable. We're not going to say there's any cap on it. I mean, it's just. You know, it, it's like a way the news cycle. I mean, the government and big business controls our news cycle. I mean, look, mm. today, Stellar Lumens is up, you know, 160, 200 percent because we had a, an IBM story come out that says they're going mm. to start using Stellar Lumens for uh, border to you know, cross border transactions. Well, mm. that news cycle right there drives up the price. Right. If the government comes yeah. out of the Russian government, the Chinese government or whatever says ICOs are bad, Bitcoin's a fraud, whatever, it, you know, they can manipulate the news cycle, which manipulates people's perspective. And so they sell and they can buy it on the low. I agree with you though, Josh. I think that big money is already coming in. I mean, we see, let me just pull up, you know, coin market cap right now. And Bitcoin is back up to 54.2% of the market dominance. You know, we're sitting at $176 billion market cap for crypto. Yeah. It, it seems like every month or so we have some huge pullback where it goes back down to maybe a hundred or 110, 130. And then we pop right back up. I mean, it smells like big money playing to me. Absolutely. And, and it's only going to get more and more. It's only going to get more and more because a, a lot of these big players, they, they have a lot of contractual rules that what they're allowed to buy and sell, especially, um, you know, funds. Uh, a lot of family offices have signed contracts with VCs or whatever that that uh, don't allow them to invest in these sort of instruments or these sort of things, these sort of assets. So now that those contracts, you know, it's been nine years or whatever it's been since Bitcoin 2009, mm -hmm. um, that that now we're starting to see, first of all, the hype, you know, five years in, now VCs are starting to get interested. And the, any new contracts that are being written now, I can guarantee they're also stating in there, we are allowed to buy digital assets. Yeah. And so, so the, the old contracts have expired. Now new con contracts are getting written up. So I think we're going to see a lot more big money, uh, smart money, whatever that means, um, coming, into the, coming into the game. And the demand's going to be there. You know, I'm, I'm currently here in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and I go to meetups every single week. And sometimes I'll don a Bitcoin shirt, right? And people are like, oh, is that Bitcoin? I'm like, yeah, you know, and they start talking about like, yeah, I want to get in. How do I get in? But just mm -hmm. think about when like the baby boomers, right? If cryptocurrencies is just a, you know, this is just a tiny market, $176 billion market. That is nothing in the big scheme of things. I mean, gold is, uh, do you know the market cap of gold off the top of your head? Not off the top of my head, but yeah. I think we're not even at 
not even at one percent in Bitcoin. I forgot. Yeah, I mean, just imagine what these hedge fund managers or these mutual fund managers are are going to say or going to do whenever their clients come up and they're like, "Hey, get me into gold." Like, I mean, get me into crypto. Like, where's your crypto fund? Right? Where's your yeah. crypto? You don't have a crypto fund. Well, I'm going to go find somebody that does have a crypto fund. Right? I want to pull out half yeah. of my investment. The 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 demand from the people from the investors, even from the small retail investors, right? The guys that have 401ks, the guys yep. that have managed IRAs, they're going to come and ask, wait, what do you mean you can't give me um, a portion of my portfolio in cryptocurrencies? Like, are you insane? Like, are you going to miss out on the biggest opportunity of my lifetime? So, yeah. yeah. It, we're, it, it's so, about- so gold is $7 trillion, around $7 trillion uh, $7 market cap. Trillion dollars. Bitcoin's at, you know, $12 billion, so. Yeah, or whatever uh, it is. No, I don't know. No, this you, is an old article, so it's yeah, no, but, yeah. Bitcoin's at ninety-five yeah, billion at the moment. Sorry, 90, ninety-five. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Ethereum's at thirty-two billion. Ripple's at eleven billion. But overall, the market cap of every single known cryptocurrency is a hundred and seventy-six billion dollars. So, point one seven six trillion dollars. Whereas the gold, just gold alone, was how much? seven trillion seven trillion dollars and that's not <laughs> and that's not every commodity that's not even every precious metal that's just yeah. gold we're talking yeah. ev- every single cryptocurrency in the world known is 176 billion dollars that's insane that's absolutely mm-hmm. insane and it's funny if you saw jamie diamond going on about why crypto is not any use it's just he basically says because we trade trillions a day and Bitcoin is like this, like you can't even measure it. Yeah. It's like, well, that actually shows the potential, right? Not anything else, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Um, but, but I think, you know, one, one point I'd like to bring up on that, that I think um, you, you mentioned before that gold bugs don't like crypto and crypto don't like gold, you mm-hmm. know, and they don't understand the two. And I, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, re- I find it so fascinating because, because Satoshi really modeled Bitcoin on gold, mathematical. It's kind of a mathematical model of gold. So it's very, very similar. It's, it's mined into existence instead of lent into existence with interest. Mm-hmm. So you, when you, when, uh, you know, they're precious numbers instead of precious metal. Mm-hmm. And, and when, you, when you start to look at all these things, where, how similar they are, but at the same time, they're totally diametrically opposed. So for instance, uh, g- gold is uh, fairly stable. Um, it's three thousand years old. It's um, it, it, but it's hard to move around. It, it's just sits there. It's heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to verify. Whereas Bitcoin's the total opposite. It's very volatile, crazy. Mm. It's um, uh, you know it's only eight years old. It's um, uh, but it's easy to verify and easy to move around. So it's got these diametrically opposed. But if you plug them together. It's really nice. So someone in a, in, a, in a developing country that can't afford these massive swings uh, will, of course, or even in developed countries, they use things like BitPay to instantly convert to cash because they don't want that volatility. But, hey, why go back into euros uh, or dollars if you can jump straight into gold right. and then straight back out to crypto when you need to spend it? So you're still in, a, in an allocated asset that has no debt attached and an asset that can't be speculated with. Um, if you're using, um, you know, good transparency protocols. So I think there's a, there's a really good tie in both for crypto and gold. And I, it is really a shame that people like Peter Schiff hasn't caught on to this. Mm. It's still sitting in this like ah, gold and uh, gold's the only thing, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're, they've both got an amazing use cases and they're mm-hmm. both very, very special uh, in, in the, the history of money. You know? So yeah, I yeah. agree. It, it is really unfortunate. I mean, I will give some love to Peter Schiff. I did quit my engineering job to move down to the Caribbean to help him build your Pacific bank. And I wouldn't have done that if I didn't really buy into what this guy was saying. But mm. it, it is a shame that he hasn't been able to understand and be curious enough about and appreciate uh, what cryptocurrencies are doing to help mm. people have free market based money. And, you know, I, I was saying the other day, I heard, I, I met with some Bitcoin guys here in Chiang Mai, and one of them told me, you know, Gerald Salente calls himself the trends forecaster, but he missed mm. the largest trend in, you know, money evolution. So, yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately, these guys are kind of rewriting their own 
history books and their mm. own reputation. And mm. I, I don't know if it's because they, it's a sales thing and they, they're not selling it. So they, they, they're just not going to spend the time to understand it. Or if it's just like an old guy thing that they're not yeah. tech savvy enough to understand it. Or if they're too proud because they think they've already reached the top of their career and, you know, oh, everything down here is kind of a bubble and I, I've already made millions of dollars and whatever. And, and, and I've been right, like for Peter Schiff, he's been right so many times. But mm. now, now, unfortunately, he is wrong. And I, I really wish the guy would listen to Eric Voorhees, for instance, who I know has come mm. on his show or listen to Roger mm. Beer, Trace Mayer, some of these guys. But you know, where, where they leave the torch, Josh, guys like you and I and a bunch of the people, the women yep. in this space, like my friend yes. Sarah Blinko, right? Oh, yeah. We're, we're, yeah. we're picking up the torch and we're carrying it forward and we're pushing yeah. the evolution of money and, you know, yeah. ultimately free market money, free market money because freedom is popular and we're doing what we can. Josh, I really appreciate you coming back on Liberty Entrepreneurs. If my audience would like to keep up with you, how can they do it? Well, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter. Um, uh, uh, Voltoro's Twitter is Voltoro. That's Volt, like a gold vault, uh, V-A-U-L-T. And Oro, which is Spanish for gold, O-R-O, Voltoro. And um, so at Voltoro on Twitter or at Voltoro, uh, sorry, um, Voltoro.com uh, if you want to check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, you can write me an email, Joshua at Voltoro, if uh, you have any questions. Cool, man. We'll list all of those links in the show notes. And yeah, thanks again for coming on. Uh, really appreciate you. You're absolutely a Liberty Entrepreneur. I can't wait to put this episode out and we'll see you at the Anarchapulco Conference. Thanks, Ash. <laughs> uh, can't wait. Looking forward to it. All right, Josh. Take care, buddy. Thanks, Ash. Ciao. This is, yep, this is Ash of Liberty Entrepreneurs signing out. Everyone, you know what to do. Keep building freedom. Till next time. <laughs>